say something real quick though is, you know, I am very joyful, joyful to see this panel of Latinos here sitting here because I didn't do this for a long time. And this is kind of one of the first times I've been with a Latino table panel, which is fantastic. So I congratulate everyone here uh, for, for doing what they're doing. Uh, the journey started, wow, I don't know, 20 years ago. The whole point was for, I wanted to become the next Puerto Rican because I went into the finance world, which it didn't pan out. <laughs> so then the next next thing was entertainment. So I was trying to find my way to see where I kind of fit in. I mean, I'm not an actor, director, writer, so I'm kind of in the little, you know, level of it. So I realized that I had to start from the bottom, so I entered into a talent agency to become an agent. So I was there for about eight, nine years, um, learned the business from the ground up, and saw the holes of the industry, basically one being the, the representation of Latinos. There weren't, I mean, I'm talking here early 2000s, so there was none of that yet, and the whole point to that, I was, you know, wanted to become a producer. So the next step was, after eight years, nine years of the agency, uh, this great TV show came out, which was called Ugly Betty, which was a TV format, <laughs> which it just sparked my interest of, that's what I want to do. So I went out and went to each country, because that's what we do internationally. We go to you know, Spain, Mexico, Argentina. Recently, about four years ago, we entered South Korea, Germany, Italy, and Norway. Um, we sell about four to six projects a year. And the whole point of this, as you saw in Julian the Phantoms, was for me to have a voice in the deciding table factor. So, meaning that I sit with executives and I get to make the choice who who comes into the projects. And that was really important for me because, you know, many years doing this in this industry, there was never one of us representing that. So that was my main focus. And now we've become one of the leading, you know, intellectual property producers that bring all this great IP here to do in English. Um, and just recently, I just found out yesterday that I just sold something. One of the products that and our next thing is we're doing a show for Fox. It's going to be one of their big temples uh, from Spain. We brought it here. So very excited about that. So that's pretty much my journey uh, with how I got started. Thank you so much. That's really thank you. to the panel because it's really, really important that shows that people are really interested in seeing, you know, and hearing what we have to say, which is really, really important. So thank you also for coming. But I'm from, I'm born and raised from Queens, New York. I'm New Rican. I'm the third generation of my family to pursue a career in garment making. My grandmother came to the States from Puerto Rico when she was a kid. She started sewing in the uh, um, sweatshops in New York City. And so it's really amazing to kind of be here having a career in costume. Um, but I started off being a nerd. I was a fan at wonder, you know, like cons like this. I started cosplaying when I was 13, and that started from my interest in costuming. And then um, I didn't realize you can have a career out of it. And when I realized you could, I went and um, went to the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York City. I interned on Broadway volunteered on a lot of student film sets, was really eager, and then um, my husband and I moved out to Los Angeles, where we've been here now for almost a decade, trying to, you know, our careers grow together, and I've been here doing, I was a costumer at Disneyland, I was a costume PA on multiple you know, studio films and TV shows, and just kind of working my way up, and now I'm here as a member of the Costume Designers Guild as a full-time costume designer, um, and uh, part of their diversity committee, because this is, you know, just kind of continuing the mission behind the camera in terms of, uh, you know, showing the importance of different stories being there as well. So, uh, that's kind of my story. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm Sandro Morales Santoro, uh, born and raised in uh, Maracay, Venezuela, which is a small uh, city. <laughs> Another Venezuelan. <laughs> We're a minority within the minority, and it's, it's good to see 
see another one as well up here. Um, so, right on. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I'm a music composer. Um, I started studying music when I was six years old, um, playing uh, drums and uh, keyboards and uh, you know piano, guitar. Uh, playing in, band, in, in bands in Venezuela and uh, you know anything from like Afro-Caribbean music to Nirvana. Um, fell in love with the music of uh, John Williams um, and um, and then also um, Latin American composers like Astro Piazzolla, Valdemar Romero, you know people who are doing theater in South America. Um, but you know when I graduated high school, uh, my family, all of them lawyers. Uh, <laughs> Oh yeah, music, <laughs> right? Like, go do like a real job first, and then and then like you can do your, your little music as a hobby. So uh, I'm a lawyer in Venezuela. If you ever get in trouble, <laughs> yeah, like reach out and uh, you know I can hook you up. But um, but here in the states, you know, like uh, after I graduated as a lawyer, worked for a little bit, saved money, went to Berklee College of Music in Boston, um, got a scholarship over there, you know. Graduated and then moved to LA and in uh, 2009. And here, you know, it's been it's been an interesting trip for sure. You know, like it's you know working uh, at first through other composers, got to write music for shows on Netflix, Hulu, you know, network shows, and then little by little, you know, making contacts and you know getting my own uh, opportunities. And uh, it's been for sure. You know, we're going to talk about that. You know, it's been a challenge as a as a Latino composer because there's a, a stigma. You know. Um, of like, you know, especially with music, you know, people assume that because you are from a from a specific place, you know, like you can only do a, a specific kind of music. And yeah, for sure, you know, I know about all that music, but you know, there's so much more. You know, I studied, you know, the classical uh, European, you know, um, music and, and jazz and all that. So you know, it's uh, um, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm working towards you know opening the door for composers like like myself. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm Lisa Zaragoza. I am an AD, assistant director. I thought I wanted to direct when I first got here, and then I directed for the first time, and I was petrified and I hated it. <laughs> but I realized I wanted to be on set, and I love AD. Um, and if you need any, Jorge, if you need any George, if you need any uh, directors, please let me know. We have a director member Absolutely. list of uh, Latino directors. Amazing, absolutely. But uh, thank you all for joining us. This is great because uh, behind the scenes, these wonderful people exist, not just in front of the camera or directly. So we are here, we are here to stay. Woo! Woo! Francisco. Yeah, I feel like I'm very much standing on the shoulders of everybody in this on this panel. Because, <laughs> you know, I graduated undergrad two years ago in the middle of the pandemic and had to move back in with my parents, watch Love, Victor under the bed sheets, because <laughs> you get it, very nice. Uh, <laughs> and, and very much use that time, you know, I had made short films, and we had shown at a lot of film festivals, um, but, you know, we didn't think the industry existed after that. In that moment, I thought, I'm never gonna direct again, the only thing that I could do is write. So, because writing was free, and you, I didn't have to wear a mask to do it. Um, <laughs> So I wrote, I wrote my, myself out of my own kind of home because um, it was my ticket out. So I was like, if I have the best script, then I can move to LA. Um, but I used that time in the middle of the pandemic to reach out to as many like TV writers and like creators as possible through Twitter, through Instagram, everything. I'd be like, can you just give me like 15 minutes of your time and like tell me about your journey? Um, so I met a bunch of Latino writers. Uh, through that process, and one of those uh, co-creators, uh, one of those writers was the co-creator of Hemplified, uh, which was a show that I really, really, really loved. And, you know, he had mentioned me for a while, but in the middle of the pandemic, I think he knew that I needed a little saving. Uh, so I sent my script to him, and he was like, if you ever move to LA, I'll make sure you have a job. And I was like, you're lying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I'm gonna take you up on it, and I moved to LA, and I became his personal assistant, and then I became the writer's assistant on season two of Amplify, then I became the script coordinator, and then I became a writer on the show. Kind of in the craziest six months of my entire life. Um, 
and they were mentors and they knew what they were doing by giving me that shot. So when once I got that co-write, everything kind of opened up to that. Right, I got my managers, I got into the union, all these things, and you know, I, I got to write on another Latino show that's gonna come out um, called Gorgita Chronicles um, <laughs> on HBO Max, and it's about an 11 year old girl who moves from the DR to, to South Florida with her immigrant parents, which I moved from Venezuela to South Florida with my immigrant parents at 11 years old, and obviously I'm a Gorgita, so <laughs> I'm like, if I don't write on this show, then what the hell? Um, <laughs> And from then I got to write now on uh, Bloodbuster. There's a show about the last Bloodbuster video in the world, mm -hmm. um, which has a bisexual Latino 20 year old film nerd. And I was like, again, if I don't remember the show, <laughs> who else are you gonna hire? Um, so there, it's literally been a year and, and three months since I moved to LA, and it's been the craziest thing to be in this panel with all the people that I like, straight up look up to. So. Uh, I, there's something about the age of 11 that everybody moves to the United States. <laughs> I also have that story. It's like the Chronicles. Uh, <laughs> but uh, BDP, welcome to WonderCon. Thank you for being here. Uh, my story actually began with Japanese animated series called Candy Candy. It was Woo! Right outside yeah. of the United States. It was the most telenovela like animated series in the world. And every time Monday morning I was devastated because somebody would die. <laughs> there was like child abuse. And I remember it to the States and it was like that's how I started the story, telling my story through drawing. And um, and of course it evolved and skipped medical school. And after college I um, made writing my purpose to be a storyteller. Um, and uh, I did see a lot of people like me um, at that time. So I was just like, well, I have, I have a I have Spanish. I look up Carlos Fuentes, maybe I can be Carlos Fuentes. And so I actually wrote a novel in Spanish because I thought it was easier than <laughs> English. Um, so with a sixth grade education, that's how it's a lot of writing. Um, and that actually did open some doors. I got a, a literary award in Mexico and I went back to Mexico. My parents were very confused. They sacrificed everything for me to go back. Um, and, but you know, it paid off because it allowed me to continue with the dream of storytelling and writing. And so when I got back to LA, broke, and kind of homeless, um, I did live in a porch for a few weeks. Um, it's like I had to start all over. My purpose was writing, so I went back and studied screenwriting like nobody's business. Like it was the last thing it was you know, for me to do, and worked on my craft with one pilot, opened all the windows. Got me my first manager, my first job um, on American Crime, worked on really upcoming um, writer. And then after that, I realized the hustle, the like trying to like make that sort of dream come true without relying on others, like depends on you. And this is a testament to all of that. I think everyone has a very similar story because Hollywood is not very friendly to Latinos, by the way. Uh, and so we're here to tell you it's possible. Uh, you just have to keep on working on what you what you're good at, what you believe in, and then one day you'll be here too. <laughs> you know, one thing I love that's very a familiar theme amongst everybody is community and family, and how much we turn to people in our own community to lift us up and give us opportunities and help us guide through this incredibly difficult process, especially for people in our community. Um, you know, it's really hard to not see people like you uh, working in the industry, and it's a, a testament to the people here, and you can see them up here, it says a lot to people who are struggling to get into the industry right now, but even more so, you want to be seen on screen, and I want to ask all of you when the first time, or if you even felt seen already on screen, if you've actually seen yourself or you're working towards actually getting yourself seen on screen, but when was the first time you felt seen on screen? George, I'll start with you. 